everybody. Uh, my name is Danny. I'm uh, doing the sharing for this morning. Uh, shall we pray to start? God, we thank you for this time of sharing and we ask that you speak to our hearts, Lord. We open up our hearts to you. May we listen with our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, uh, this morning I would like to share about uh, uh, humility, the way of Jesus. Um, uh, how shall I start? Uh, you know, in the past, right, when I was a young man, um, when I was younger, uh, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, they came out wrong. When I was younger, I, uh, I used to look at the church aunties and the church uncles. I used to think to myself, oh no, these church aunties and these church uncles are so uncool. Oh, when they talk, it's so slow. And they're like, they talk about their own things. They're so uncool. But when I grew up, older and older, right, I began to realize, hey, there's something special about these aunties and these uncles. And uh, I would like to relate an experience uh, that I had that really uh, can encapsulate what I mean. Um, a few years ago, I had a chance to uh, sit uh, with an uh, ex-youth member. He was about... Um, 18, 19 by then, he had left the youth, but one day we received a call that uh, his mother was passing away, you know, so it was really like a, like a deathbed vigil. So uh, uh, they, called, uh, they called the people in the youth, and one of the youth people called me and said, can you go and uh, sit with this boy? So uh, I, I, I thought it was one of my cell group members. So I went there, then I realized, hey, this one is not my cell member, this is another person's cell member, I have no... I, I don't know this boy well, but he knows me because uh, by that time I was, ser well, I was already serving quite heavily um, when he was a teenager. Um, so, so I sat with him. Uh, um, at one point, uh, his father had left and it was just me and him at the hospital. It was the first time I had ever sat at the bedside of someone who was passing away. And um, the mom was uh, uh, passing away from cancer. And um, so, you know, they had a certain chance to say goodbyes, but I'm sure it is, uh, it, it was, it was always a difficult uh, process. And so, the boy was just sitting there, and the mom was really unconscious by then, and we were just like dozing off, and I said, never mind, uh, I will stay up with you. At about 7 a.m., um, uh, auntie uh, passed away, and, uh, and uh, I woke the boy up, and... And I realized at that time, I didn't know what to do. I mean, how do you comfort someone whose parent has just passed away and someone that's so young? And my parents have not passed away, you see. And I don't have such, ex such close experience with death yet. And I really didn't know what to do. And then, uh, soon after, uh, the boy called his dad. The dad called, guess who? The aunties and the uncles of the church. And so, uh, Sister Christine came. All right. And I remember this very well. And I, I remember when, when Sister Christine arrived, Auntie Christine arrived, I was like, ah, oh, good. Somebody who knows what to do is here. And really, when Sister Christine arrived, right, she was so calm and so collected and she knew the right things to say. She was able to comfort the family, you know. And I just felt a great sense of comfort myself. And I told myself that if one day, right, if when my parents pass away or somebody close to me passes away, I would want an auntie or uncle from the church to be by my side. And that's, that time, it really sticked my mind about how precious it is to have aunties and uncles in church. And sometimes, aunties and uncles in church, we look at the young and we think that, hey, my time is past. Now is the time for the young. But actually, let me assure you, that, to me, that is completely untrue. The young have a lot to learn from those who have gone before them. And, and so now, years, these few years, whenever I go to praise and worship, I love to look at the uncles and the aunties. Sometimes when I have having some trouble or some personal issue and I, I don't know what to do, I'm very stressed about it, I look at the uncles and the aunties and they just put up their hand and they're just worshipping God sincerely. And I think, and, and some of these aunties and uncles I know, 
They have been Christian since the time in their youth and they have not lost the faith. Last night I said that there are many people who have grown up in Christian families but they are not in church anymore. They have lost the faith. They do not know Jesus. But these aunties and uncles, they spend decades serving God, loving God. And when I look at them, I tell myself that when I am 50, 60, 70, 80, I want to be like them. And I want to love God just as they have. I want to be able to look back at my life and say, wow, what a great journey with God it has been. And that's why I, I put up this verse. In the past, right, I used to think that I need to be like, uh, I want to be someone great in the kingdom of God. I want to be like Moses. I want to part the Red Sea. I want to be famous. I want to preach to a lot of people. I want to do this. I want to do that. And I felt that these few years, right, God has been asking me, is it okay if you're not? Is it okay if you are just like Enoch? Enoch only has one line, one sentence dedicated to him in the Bible, which is that he walked faithfully with God. And then there was no more. Walking faithfully with God is what defined his entire life. Not what he do, not who he talked to, not how much money he had, not how much achievement he had, not how smart he was, not how good looking he was, not how many children, nothing. He was defined by he walked faithfully with God and then finish. And I want my life to be like that. I want my life to be like that all the way until I'm old and until I die. In short, I want to follow Jesus. But you see, following Jesus is very interesting because right, following Jesus cannot be something that's done in a half-hearted manner. If you follow Jesus halfway, then we are missing out on a lot of things. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone uh, give in exchange for their soul? The New Living Translation gives a slightly different translation. They say, if anyone wants to be my follower, if anyone wants to follow Jesus, he or she must give up their own way and take up their cross and follow me. And what does it mean to give up our own way? What does it mean to take up our own cross? And we need to think, what was Jesus on earth here to do? Essentially, Jesus did a lot of things, but there was one main thing he was here to do, and that is to die. He came here to die for everybody. And here, Jesus is saying very clearly that if we want to follow Him, we must die, just like He did. But we're not talking about the death that comes to everybody, for we know that everybody here will die one day, and nobody escapes death. So what is Jesus talking about? What is this death He's talking about? He's talking about death on the cross. The death on the cross is a different death from all other deaths. It is not death from old age. It is not death from a fall. It is not death from sickness. It is not death from punishment or for crime. It is death for people that you love. And because Jesus loved the world so much, because Jesus loved all of us so much, so He came on earth with only one purpose, and that is to die for us, to do the greatest thing in history, which is to die for our sins, because nobody in the history of the world has been able to get rid of their sin. And so, to die, to take up our cross, means to die to ourselves. Just as Jesus, when He died, He gave up everything. He gave up his, any dreams. He gave up children. He gave up a wife. He gave up any ambition. He gave up comfort. He gave up money. He gave up fame. He gave up friends. He gave up everything for the people that He loved. And the only thing that He do when He was alive and until He died is that He followed the will of the Father. And Jesus said that my bread is to do the will of the one who has sent me. So Jesus gave up any way of the human and he followed only one way, which is he do what God asked him to do, he feel what God asked him to feel, and he talked to who God asked him to talk to. Everything, it depends on what God tells him. Nothing, he listened to himself. And so, right, when I look at, wow, we must give up our own way. 
we must stop pursuing our own things if we want to follow Jesus. We must follow Jesus just as Jesus followed the Father. Then, right, I find that there's one thing that Jesus asked me to give up about my way, and that is my way of pride. This is very important because to God, pride is one of the worst things there are. And God really doesn't like pride. You know it's pride? Um, this morning uh, when I was... Uh, when I was thinking about the message, right, I remember uh, when I was younger, when I was a teenager, right, and one day I, I stepped into the English service and uh, I was not dressed for service like now. You know, I think I was wearing some berms or whatever. So I was just dressed like a, like a poor teenager, you know what I mean? And, and I came in and I noticed that none of the ushers shook my hand. The people, any other person come in, they shake hand. When I walk in, they all just like look down, look away, I'm like, what's wrong with you, man? I thought we were a church. What, I'm not good enough for you? You know? You know why I have that reaction? Because, right, I felt, hey, I'm somebody you know. You think you are so good. I may be dressed like this, but I'm somebody you know. How dare you look down on me? And I wanted to share this. I want to tell, I want to tell the church that, hey, this one is wrong. Huh? You're cannot kind of just. But then this morning, right, God gave me a new thought. My behavior at that time is also wrong. You know why or not? Because I felt I'm somebody. You see, uh, pride tells us that we are somebody. But Jesus, in His humility, even though He is somebody, and not just somebody, He's somebody great. He is the creator of of the universe. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And Jesus is that Word. In the beginning, Jesus was already there because Jesus is God. Such a great God. But He made Himself nothing. You see, the Bible verse shows us here that Jesus, even though He's in the very nature of God, He made Himself nothing. My title right. Jesus' humility, I am a nobody, but the Bible verse even go more than that. The Bible verse say, Jesus make himself nothing. Not even a person, he's nothing. This is the humility of Jesus. So, so what was wrong with my thought about people coming in and uh, I'm coming in, people not shaking my hand? Because this morning, I saw Brother Lai. And Brother Lai, when he come in, right, he shake everybody's hand. Lai didn't say like, hey, I'm somebody, you know, you all should shake my hand. Why you never shake my hand? No. He say, hey, you are somebody, let me shake your hand. You, can you see the difference in a perspective? He didn't focus on himself. He didn't say, look at how important I am. You need to accept me. He said, I need to accept you. So he shake the hands of the usher. It's not his job, but he shake the hand of the usher. That is humility. Sorry, lie. i got to use your example. It's a great example. Where is, okay, I think it's gone now. That is Humility. Now, let me explain to you why I have such a big problem with pride. The short answer is that I'm simply too smart. <laughs> I grew up uh, very smart. Not as smart as some of you here, but pretty smart. Um, in primary school, I was, sorry, I'm consulting my notes. Yesterday, people asked me why I keep looking at my phone. Uh, my notes are all here, so I won't forget what I was going to tell you. My primary school, I was in the best class. All right, it was a neighborhood school, it was a normal school, but still the best class. And then when I finished primary school at our end of the school leaving, uh, in our leaving exams, I got a seventh in the entire school. Number seven, I was pretty shocked myself. So uh, that was when I really felt, wow, I really am quite smart. And I went to one of the best secondary schools in Singapore, we are top three at least. All right, and you know, Singapore boasts the the best education system in Southeast Asia, if not the world. They are top three in the world probably, and I'm top three in the top three country of the world for education. And I felt really proud of myself. And when I finished my four years of secondary school, I got straight A's. And that's seven A1s and three A2s. All right? That's, for me, that's straight A's, even though it's not a perfect 10 A1s. And, and the, you know what was the problem? Is that I was uh, growing up among other smart people. Even though I got straight A's, <coughs> for my results, 
In my school, still, I was only above average slightly. I was in the top 150 people out of 450 students in my school that year. And that is how smart that whole school is. But nevertheless, I thought that, hey, I'm still pretty good. So when I entered teacher training college, and I look, at, I look around, and I realised that it was school from a school. I realised that a lot of the teachers in a teacher training college right, are not from the kind of schools that I'm from. And I look down on them. And that is the great secret about me that a lot of people don't know. I'm not a nice person. <laughs> I look like a nice person because I have stage skills. I'm trained for this. As a teacher, and in years of my ministry, I'm trained to smile on cue. <laughs> I can do it. On Sundays, I can speak to you normally. But let me tell you the great secret about me. Because of the pride that is in my heart, I look down on nearly everybody. Everybody that comes in, I'll size you up. And I'll think, are you at my level? Are you above my level? Or are you below my level? I do. I do. And I have a lot of mean thoughts about everybody. And I mean it. I mean it. You know, if you were to come to me, and if you know me a bit, if you don't know me and I don't know you, then very hard for, you, for me to have mean thoughts about you. But if you know me and I know you, you come to me and say, Danny, what do you think of me in the past? I can tell you. And it'll be mean. And I repent of those thoughts. And it's very difficult for me sometimes to get rid of these thoughts. But I feel that God, this is not God's way. God does not have mean thoughts about people. God does not, God is so humble. Jesus is so humble. And I have mean thoughts about everybody in my school. But then, God started to mold me. And God started to show me that in, in teacher's training college, even though my results were one of the best, but I was simply not the best teacher there. There were many people who came from inferior, with inferior grades. And they seemed to be so creative with uh, lessons. They know how to engage this student and that student. And I struggled very much with that. My first year as a teacher was pretty horrible. My pride was still strong. I denied it all. I thought that, never mind, it just takes me some time. So when I entered my first school as a full-fledged teacher, um, I came in, I was ambitious. I asked, uh, they attached a senior teacher to me to uh, handhold me through my first year. And I asked the senior teacher, I said, what can I do to become head of department as soon as I can? Now that I'm an older teacher, I've just finished about eight years of, uh, of uh, uh, education, of teaching, of teaching line, I can tell you that um, uh, if you work hard at it, if you're an average teacher, maybe you'll hit uh, head of department in about 10 years' time. If you're particularly talented, you're four to five years. If Singapore government thinks that you're a scholar type, you're really, really good, they will fast track you within three years, you are at some level. But when I went in, I was ambitious. And I thought, I'm going to clear, uh, I'm going to be as good as a head of department three, four, five years. Easily, I thought I could do it. And then, uh, it was a pretty toxic uh, work environment. The, the, what was it? The senior teacher attached to me. She went and told everybody in the department, hey, this one, uh, want to climb, you know this one? Uh, this one want to climb, huh? Let's see what he's made of. So all the, all the colleagues had to look at me, one kind, like waiting for me to slip up. Did I slip up? Well, yes, I slip up a lot. And uh, in, um, uh, in my time, when I went to, the, the teacher training college, there were many, uh, there were quite a few of us around my age who also uh, entered. And so in our church, there are like seven to ten MOE, Singapore MOE trained teachers. And, and let me tell you, each of them have done better than me. I'm pretty sure I got better results than all of them when I was in school, but each of them have done better in their school than me. And, and, uh, and my first year was a, was a failure because uh, I, I didn't uh, mark my students' work on time. I was not so good with my lessons. I didn't know how to talk to the students, you know. And then I just didn't know what I was doing. I needed so much help. And uh, one day, uh, something happened. The kids took an, a, a small exam, and I marked the exam papers, and I lost the papers. And I couldn't find them. I searched for two days. I, I just couldn't find them. And till today, I don't know where they are. It was a horrible thing. Now, you, you don't understand. As a teacher, uh, I was telling people uh, uh, last night, as a teacher, there are three things 
uh, that you cannot do in Singapore. Number one, you cannot have any kind of a physical relationship with a teacher, uh, with, a, with a student. You cannot. No rom romantic relationship at all. That's grounds for dismissal. Number two, uh, you cannot have any financial embarrassment. We've had uh, HODs who are dismissed uh, within a few months because they owe banks money and they cannot pay and they didn't declare. And then some of them were bankrupt or they own loan shark money and MOE will let you go for that. And thirdly, the thing that you cannot do is that you cannot lose exam paper. <laughs> you cannot. You cannot have cases where you allow students to cheat. The exam is a sacred thing in the, in the ministry, in the schools. And I lost exam paper. Now imagine, as a first-year teacher, supposed to have bright prospects, you lose exam paper. When I went to my boss, I said, I'm sorry, ma'am, I lost exam paper. She was shocked. I think there's never been a first-year teacher like me. She said, she, no, she, really, I, I'm not kidding. She's like, how did it happen? What happened? I said, I'm sorry, ma'am. I don't know what happened. You know, I was marking. I went here. I searched everywhere already. I just cannot find it. Then she kind of like, listened. Oh. But, but what happened? <laughs> How did it happen? She cannot believe it. And from that day on, I felt that my career is in shambles. No need to hope to be a high-ranking fella in a, in a short amount of time. Just let it all go. Might as well be humble and just do my job. Because anyway, I'm not good. So what's there to be proud about? So I do my job. From that day on, I start the next year afresh. I really, really do my job. I try my best. All right, I spend long hours in school. There was a point in time where I would uh, finish school. At, uh, I would leave the office at 7. And then after that, I would go for a short swim just to get my energy up. And then after that, I'll go off to a, a library in Singapore just to finish the work, you know. And uh, that's uh, maybe 9 o'clock, I'll drive back to JB. You know, reach home about 10 plus that day, that time the jam not so bad. Eat dinner, you sleep about 11, 11 plus, you wake up the next day, and there you go. So I do this about two or three times a week for just one or two years. It was pretty tough, but you know, that's, I just had to work. And an amazing thing happened because as I worked and as, as I felt that God called me to be more and more humble, right? Every year during my work review, uh, every teacher is expected to like uh, kind of promote yourself. You've got to tell your boss what you did well in and why, why you think you justify a good grade for your, work, for your work review that year. Now, instead of telling people how good I was, this time, I felt that God said that you go the other extreme. So I always tell my boss how bad I was. <laughs> so every time, my, my boss asks, so Danny, how do you find, uh, how do you think you performed this year? I say, oh man, this year was bad, uh, this year. The files are not done properly. The work is not marked properly. Then the student, the result like this. Then, you know, that deadline I never meet. Oh, I think I did a very bad job. Now, a funny thing happened which is, you remember the senior teacher who, um, who spread the gossip about me? Now, she became my boss. <laughs> and so, I served, under here for about three to, I served under her for about three to four years. And, and the first year, suddenly, she just said, Hey, Danny, do you want to teach the secondary four students? Now, in a school, you might... Uh, um, you only attach strong teachers to SEC4 students because they are graduating level students. You cannot attach inexperienced fellas. So I said, ma'am, I'm so, I don't know how to do. I'm so inexperienced. I don't think I can do it. But she insisted and there was really nobody else, so I took it up. Without knowing it, I, I, I served as a secondary four teacher for years after that. And another strange thing happened. As, and, and now, since she's my boss, so majority of my work review is with her. So I always tell her how lousy I am. She, and then she would, and then she, would, she changed, you know. Say, no, Danny, you're very good. You're very good. You see, last year you produced result, very good. Every, so nowadays, every time I tell her, oh, no, like, I'm very bad, I'm very bad, I think I cannot. No, you're very good. When it's, and then every I'll tell them, hey, I want to leave, I want to leave. I, I think uh, I need to come back to JB. 
Then they were like, no lah, don't leave lah, you're doing very well, leave for what? They never believed me. And then when I finally left last year, they said, why did you leave? We miss you so much. She just message, she messages me about once a few, every few weeks now, even now. And she's not even my boss anymore. Such a big difference. It's so strange. The one that used to look down on me, suddenly I have a lot of favour with her. Suddenly she loved me so much. <laughs> even though I'm really not good. I can tell you this, as a teacher who I think I know my staff, I can tell you there are many people who are better than me in the teaching line. But being humble makes a difference to my life. When, uh, let me tell you another story. One day, uh, one day uh, I... Uh, I, one day I served in the church, right? Uh, at that time, I was in the, the top committee of the, the youth. And at that time, I was still maybe about, say, 23, 24, 25. And then what happened was that uh, we'll always meet to discuss things. Now, in that, uh, in that committee, there was also the youth pastor at that time. All right, and the youth pastor... Um, uh, uh, the youth pastor... Uh, I mean, he was like the first among equals. He didn't really uh, enforce his will or whatever. You know, he was always very gentle. And he wanted to uh, give us opportunity, the young ones, as much as, uh, as he could. He was very good. But I had a problem. And my problem was that I looked down on him. I thought that this one is not educated. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not kidding. This one is not educated. All right. This one does not know teenagers. You know, I listen to the music. I watch the movies. What do you do? You stay in the church, man. What do you know about life? And so every time when we discuss things and discuss projects, I don't think, how can you say this? How can you suggest that? That is not going to work. And then sometimes uh, when you make decision for the youth, I'll say, that's a dumb decision. What's wrong with you? And that's what is going around in my head. And I was so proud. And I thought that I just have to come against you every time we discuss. So every time, every time, I took every opportunity to shoot him in committee discussions. To a point where I can, I can tell, I shocked myself. There, there's a, there was a point, there was one, one night when we met and, and I realised that I was just trying to uh, 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 debate against him to provoke him. I wanted to be as provocative as possible to make him lose his temper, to make him lose his composure, so that when he does that, everybody will see that this guy is not as good as he thinks he is. Or is not as good as you all think he is. And so we quarrel. How, how do you serve together in a situation like this? It's, it's not possible. I remember once we went on a mission trip together. Right? I was leading the team. He was like uh, running between teams because he was like overall in charge. One day, he joined us in uh, Cambodia. When I saw him walking towards me, I turned around and walked away. And that's how much I didn't like him. But, you know, God did a miracle. I talked about this issue to everybody. I talked to all my fellow, my peers in the ministry. I said, look at this pastor. How can he do this and do this and do this and do this? These are dumb decisions. We should tell him to do this and this. He should follow this way, this way, this way, this way. And everybody just kind of listened and just, mm, yeah, they didn't know, really know what to say. And one day I was driving uh, back from work and suddenly I had a very strong thought. And the thought was that, what are you trying to do? Okay, so today, if you manage to kick him out of the ministry, then are you going to take over? Then suddenly I was shocked. I thought to myself, hey, I'm not good enough to take over. If this pastor leaves, I also don't know what to do. Even though I may disagree with some of his decisions, but the people were with him. The teenagers, they were willing to follow him. And he was willing to, to minister to them and to lead them and to teach them the right things. I realised that I could not replace him. I realized that he could do 
what I cannot do. I said, no, God, if he leaves, also I don't know what to do. By that time, things had gotten so bad that uh, Pastor James had to call the two of us in for a meeting to mediate. But that meeting was almost unnecessary because by the time we sat down with Pastor James, God had already spoken that to me and I was ready to apologize. I was ready to, to say, actually, I appreciate what you have done. I'm sorry for the words that I use and how I used to attack you. And he apologized also. And the meeting ended so fast. <laughs> and from then on, uh, every time, uh, he's no longer serving the youth with us, but from then on, he still served a few more years. From then on, every time he spoke up in a meeting, he suggested, I'll say, hmm, this is a good suggestion. We must listen to him. And I meant it. I was like, I really meant it. I said, hey, this is quite a good idea. This is a correct value. Every time I say something, you know, I bring up a concern. He will say, guys, what Danny bring up is an important concern. We must listen to that. It was so amazing. And one day, maybe two or three years after that, there was a camp that we went to together. And when during the praise submission, I suddenly, I, I, I suddenly began to have all these thoughts about how this pastor invested in my life, how he brought me around when I was a young teenager and how he spent time talking to me. And suddenly, I was full of gratitude for him. And I went over to him and this time, I apologized even more sincerely. I said, I remember what you have done for me. I'm so thankful. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry for the things that I've done before. So he cried. I also cried. And then he prayed for me. And today, we're like best buddies, you know? You know what I mean? It's like, you, it's so hard to find people in the ministry who are willing to support you, who really accept you, no matter what mistakes you have made. And that's how I feel that He has done for me. Because the best word to describe me when I was a teenager and when I was a young leader is the English word, insufferable. <laughs> insufferable means cannot suffer Him. It's like, oh, this guy, oh... To me, the most humble people are the people who tolerated me when I was a young, when I was a young teenager and a young leader. And this experience taught me that I cannot be so proud. You see, that, that pastor, he is not educated true. He cannot speak English as well as I can true. But God anoint him more. When he speak, people are touched. When he pray, there's ministry. In his life, you can see the fruit of the Spirit. Could I say the same about myself? Now, I've preached so many times since my first time in the youth. And let me tell you, there's so many times where I'm having cold sweat on stage when I know deep down in my heart that nobody is listening to me. I know I can feel it and I know that I go up and come down makes no difference to their life. I know when what I do is for my own strength, it has no effect on the people. And I, and I saw that God taught me even more over the years that the race is not to the strong or the swift. It is depending on who God calls and who is willing to answer the call of God. No matter how intelligent or how unintelligent, how skilled or unskilled, how rich or poor, how famous or not famous, how all these things do not matter. Because when God anoints a person, God is able to add to the person so much that he will be better than all the other people like me. Because God has chosen to use the foolish to shame the wise. And this is true. In my ministry, I found that it is true many times over. One day I had to, uh, recently we had to uh, select, uh, we had to invite uh, a speaker for our youth camp. And uh, I was handling the camp with a few of uh, the other youth committee members. And I had someone in mind. 
uh, that someone happened to be the pastor that I struggle with, but that's beside the point. Just a fun fact. So I wanted to get that pastor to come and uh, speak at our camp. Um, when I suggested this in the WhatsApp uh, with uh, my community members, they all kind of like, well, yeah, I guess you could do the job, but why not this other person? And this person is like this uh, pastor from Singapore. And I know that uh, some of my, my co-leaders, they really like, they really admire this uh, pastor. So I asked, I asked Bunfei, I said, who is this guy? Have you heard of him before? Bunfei said, hey, oh, this guy, mm, this guy is quite young, you know. You know so uh, he's got some YouTube link. So he sent me uh, the guy's YouTube link and I went to uh, uh, listen to him preach on YouTube. His preaching was okay, it's not so bad. Um, he, he, he preached with a lot of passion. He said, oh, you know, we must love God. We must have the heart of David. Uh, da David. We must have the heart of uh, David and the heart of Mary. And we must love God. There is only one thing which is the most important. You know, and he keep preaching like this about how it's important to follow God. And I think, hey, I also preach about this What I also can. And then, <laughs> and then I saw that he is very young. In fact, he is about my age. And, and then, right, without realizing it, right, I began to feel very jealous of him. I didn't realize it. I rejected him as the speaker. I, I told the guys, I really don't think that this guy is suitable. And the reason that I give them, and the reason that I give myself, is that uh, when he speaks, he uses language that is too spiritual. Our teenagers cannot understand. Talk about anointing, talk about prompting, talk about the burdens, talk about all these things. Our teenagers are not like that. They won't understand what he's talking about. We should not get this guy. But as the week went by, I felt that God is telling me again, look, your reaction towards this signal pastor is too big. Whenever my reaction towards something is too big, that means that there is an issue inside of me that needs to be settled. It's not about the pastor anymore. There's something wrong with me. And as I continue to think about it over the days, I realized that I was jealous of him because he's like someone I want to be. You see, the... Uh, in, my, in my career as a teacher, I did not rise high. I'm eight years in, I'm nowhere close to being a head of department. I'm just too disorganized. And, and I always comforted myself and I said that you, you don't do well in the corporate sector or in the public sector is fine because you will do well in the church. Because I spent a lot of time in the ministry in the church. And I thought to myself, maybe God didn't call me to be a great teacher or a great whatever leader in the school, but God called me to be a great leader, a great minister in the church. And I keep waiting for it. I'm waiting for the day that I can become famous, where I can walk in and people go like, wow, this guy is here. You know, I love that feeling. I love the feeling of stepping into the youth service and feeling like I'm the saviour. The saviours arrive to save your service. So, so when, when I saw this Sigma pastor, I, I saw that he, ha, uh, he is known by so many other people in Singapore. He's young, he's passionate. But who am I? I mean, how many people watch my video on YouTube? <laughs> And even so, I'm sure it's, <laughs> I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's numbered very little. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, I'm just in church. I cannot, I, I'm not there yet. I'm not able to have conferences in JB to do such things. I'm just not that good. And I felt that God challenged that thinking. God says that, what if, I don't call you to be like that. What if my calling for you is not to be famous, is not to do great things in the ministry or in the corporate sector? What if you are supposed to be very average in the eyes of other people? And you must understand 
that when I was growing up, in those schools and in that environment, there's an indoctrination because we're a top school. They say you are the leaders. You are the best in the country. You are the cream of the crop. You are meant to be at the head. And I really grew up thinking that I was meant for great things, one way or the other. And I felt that God challenged me. Say, if there is no great thing for you, if you are just supposed to walk with me and just serve me faithfully where I put you, is it enough for you? Is that enough for us? Is it enough to have Jesus even though we are in debt our whole life? Even though we have to pay the bank uh, until the day we die? Is it enough for us? Is it enough for us knowing that we did not get to achieve uh, the dreams that we had in our youth? And some of you are your retirement age now. And maybe we look back and we think that, what have I done in my life? All the great things I thought I was meant to achieve. Or maybe all the great things that I, I had achieved in the past, but where am I now? Is it enough that we are, we are where we are? Maybe even we have nothing. Maybe even we lost all our money, our business failed and we're bankrupt, but we have Jesus. Is that really enough? Because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that it is enough. Because Paul says that everything also I can give up so that I can gain Christ, so that I can know the love of Christ. Is it enough that we remain single for the rest of our life? Is it enough that we have no children for the rest of our life? Is it, is it enough that there is this thing in our heart that we want so much but we can seem to never get it? Is it enough when we have Jesus? That's not a question that... I can't answer that question because I'm not you. I'm not standing where you are. I'm not sitting where you are. I haven't been through the things that you have been through. I can only tell you what the Bible says and what God is speaking to me. And God is challenging me to, 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 to see and to say, Danny, can I be enough? Were you there to walk with me to see whether or not I am enough for you? And that was the great test of that experience. And that was the great message of that experience to me. Eventually, uh, I went to meet the, the pastor on behalf of the, the youth committee because we had to evaluate him. I uh, allowed my co-leaders, my peers to make the decision uh, because anyway, I wanted to empower them to do it. Even though I didn't agree with them, it's okay, you all go here. And they said they want to check out the guy, so we're going to check out the guy. So I had to go to check out the guy because I'm more senior. All right, they all cannot make it, so never mind, I make a recommendation for you. So I went with another brother from the church. When we went, I realized that he is really not as bad as I thought. <laughs> we sit down, and the first thing is, uh, he says he's married. I say, hmm, I'm married. And he says, and he starts to describe how God touched him when he was younger. He described the ministry that he do in the past, and I know uh, that he can speak simple language to simple people. He talked about prayer. He talked about the importance of the Bible, of the Word. And I say, yes, I fully agree with you. And then lastly, he said, my, my wife pregnant. I said, hey, I also have a child. And then when I finally gathered up my courage, put aside my pride, and I, and I decide, okay, we can invite him for the... Uh, speaking I open my mouth and I say actually we have come here because we want to invite you to be the speaker for our camp and I was ready to let go of all this desire to have my younger leaders look up to me because when he comes I'm sure they will, be, they will like him a lot I was ready to let all of that go I had to never mind just let it go and guess what he said he said oh thanks for inviting me I cannot make it my wife giving birth, I can't make it. 
And I think God was really just teaching me this important lesson. No. When, when we pride ourselves because we're somebody, when we have that thing and we lose it, it will really hurt us. Let me give you an example. There is this very famous uh, mixed martial arts uh, person, this fighter called Ronda Rousey. Some of the younger ones here should know her. Now, this Ronda Rousey had grown up as an Olympic champion. In her late teens, she already went, represented the US to do uh, judo in the Olympics, and she did well. And she always has the mindset to be a champion. It's her deep desire to be the best uh, fighter. When she joined this mixed martial arts, you may have seen it on TV sometimes, she did very well. She was a champion, undefeated for two years. Anytime anybody tried to fight her, uh, they lose. Sometimes they lose in under one minute. So she was very good. And she always, English would say, trash talk everybody. She would go and then she would tell people, you suck, you suck, you suck, everybody sucks. And then I'm the best. You know, and she tells people how lousy they are. And she, she, she glorifies herself so much because she really thought, I am the best. And then, right, one day, she lost. After telling the whole world that just as how she has won for the past few years, she will win again. This person is not going to win me. This person is a fraud. That person somehow won her. Uh, in like under two minutes or something. It was a solid victory. And you know what? Because this, this Ronda Rousey had, had achieved her dream of being a champion, her deep desire, when she lost that match and she was no longer a champion, suddenly her world collapsed. When she, when she uh, went to get her wounds treated, when she was in the hospital just stitching herself out and everything, right? She had suicidal thoughts. She said, if I can't be a champion, and who am I? And that's what's going to happen to any of us who hold on so tightly to things that we deeply desire. When we achieve it and we lose it, that's what's going to happen. But if we leave aside and we hold on to Jesus, Jesus is my desire. Jesus is enough for me. We will never have to experience such things because Jesus will never pass away. Jesus will never die. My pride also taught me that my needs come first. But Jesus, humility, Jesus is so humble. For Jesus, God comes first. Others come first. Let me give you an example of how prideful I was in this area. Um, one day, uh, we were in the, the teen service and, uh, and uh, at the time I was a pretty senior leader already and there was the, whoever was speaking on the stage, right, they came up and there's some problem with the computer, right? And I, I was sitting down there, you know, I'm the one that sits here most of the time in the, in the youth, so I come out to help, you know, and I'm helping, helping, helping. And at that time, our brother uh, Jabez, you all know Jabez, right? So our brother Jabez had just joined the ministry not too long ago as a full-time staff in the church. And as a full-time, naturally, he was attached to the youth because he's a pretty youthful fella and he has a heart for the young people. The problem was, I didn't like him very much. I mean, I mean people thought he was very good looking. I didn't. <laughs> I mean, I thought I was good looking, but... You know, nobody ever told me that except for my wife. <laughs> I was like, eh, this guy. And then, you know, people like his youthfulness. Teenagers laugh, 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 his, laugh, laugh at his jokes. You know, he seemed to be well-liked by everybody, whatever he did. And so there was this deep dislike for him because he's somebody, I'm a nobody, I feel, compared to him. And then, and then while I'm fiddling the thing, right, and I can't seem to get it to work, and the fella comes up, and Jabez has no idea I feel this way about him, 
I'm not sure if he knows now even. <laughs> he's supposed to be here listening to this. So, so he comes up, right? And he's, he's like, hey, hey, can I help? Can I help? Let me help. What help do you need? You know what I say to him? I say, bro, don't crowd the stage. <laughs> Let them know. I tell you, once I said it, I knew that is our pride. So Jabez just, oh, okay, never mind. So he go back and sit down. But you know, Jabez is a pretty nice guy. He doesn't, he doesn't like to confront people. So he told someone else that he felt very hurt by that comment. And, and, um, and that someone else told me, I said, Daya, this one, really prideful. So I apologized to him. I said, I'm sorry for what I said. I didn't mean it, you know. And, and this is what I mean by my feelings come first. I, I had no regard for Jabez's feelings. I was just concerned about, well, I got to be the hero. And, and uh, later, and um, one or two months ago, uh, I've been hearing messages about uh, humility. And um, I told God, I said, God, it's so easy for me to be proud when I am successful, when I succeed in my ministry or whatever thing I succeed in. I said, God, uh, I think you better give, give me more failure so that I won't be so proud. Because, you know, our humble heart, right, is more important to God than our great ministry. And I know that uh, even if I fail, but I'm humble, God is pleased with that. No matter what great things I do, if I'm proud. So, soon after I make that prayer, I start to quarrel with my wife for the entire week. And every time I quarrel with her, right, it's a prideful thing. I will just like, be very, I will, we'll just be talking about something and I'll get very worked up. I'll be like, no, you are wrong. I'm right. You are wrong. I'm right. And I just try to use very strong statements to make her feel that she's wrong. And I realize that every time is I'm too prideful. I just need to insist that she thinks as I do, that she does as I do. One day, we were going shopping a week after that. And then... Uh, uh, it was on a Saturday night after service. My mother was with us. And then halfway through, I was very tired. I wanted to go home already. And also, baby was like getting very frustrated. And, uh, and then I said, and my wife said, maybe we should go home. I said, okay, good. I also want to go home. And then as we were walking, 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 right, my mom, you know, still like very free, you know, very enthusiastic about shopping. Say, hey, got these clothes, got that clothes. Hey, this one baby can wear. Let's go ahead and see now. I'm like, oh man, I'm really tired. And I get so, so, so frustrated because when my, when my mother goes in to see the clothes, my wife, instead of following me, follows my mom in. <laughs> I'm like, you know I'm tired. Why you want to go in? And then I was so angry at two of them. After they came out from the shop, I took the push cart and I just walk off very fast. I assumed that they were following me. <laughs> they, 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 they were, they were. They were. Just not as fast as I thought they were. And I walk and I walk and I walk and I walk. And I didn't know that at one point, uh, uh, my wife and my mom couldn't see me anymore. And the baby was with them. And then, right, and then... Uh, uh, I thought, okay, never mind, you know, I'm sorry. I told my wife, I'm sorry, I lost my temper just now, you know. Uh, and I uh, was impatient. And then when we went home, right, I noticed that my wife was still a bit cold to me. Not so much want to talk to me. So, after that, when we both showered, then we lay in bed at night, then she said, actually, I'm very hurt because I felt very abandoned by you at the shopping mall just now. Because you left me with a senior citizen and a baby. <laughs> now, she was really hurt. But to me, uh, it's like, I'm still very proud, you know. I, I told her, you have a phone, what? Why you never call me? Call me, uh, that's what phones are for. Then she said, no, that's not the point. I said, 
I already told you all, I'm very tired. Then you're still dragging. So I just try to reply her over and over again. Try to shift the blame back to her. But all the time, as I continue to do this, right, she gets more and more upset. See, my wife is very humble. She will not shout at me. But she has feelings. So she looked like she wants to cry already, you know. More and more and more. Then, I, then in my heart, right, I know this. But I refuse to look. In, in my heart at the same time, I just felt there was a voice inside that said, Hey, just apologize lah. What's the problem? Just apologize lah. But my mouth remained closed. I refused to apologize. Until I saw that, wow, I think she really, really wants to cry already. And I know that God wants me to be humble. So, at the end, after five minutes, ten minutes, I said, okay lah, I'm sorry. Even though, you see, even if I was right that she could have called me, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter because her feelings are important. She is important, therefore her feelings are important. And there have been many times in my life where if you're wrong, I'm going to tell you. If I disagree with you, I'm going to tell you. If you're doing something dumb, I'm going to tell you. I don't care how you feel about it because it's the truth, man. It's the fact. Deal with the facts. Come on, don't be so emotional. Be objective a bit. And I didn't understand what it means by you got to take care of another person's feelings because their feelings are important to them and they are important. And that's why if you look at how God deals with our feelings in the Bible, God is amazingly gentle. Uh, let me skip this. I just want to highlight Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, right, is when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And um, at this time, he is very distressed. He is not looking forward to his time on the cross. And he knows what it's for. He knows the great work. And he knows that he need, it is because he loved all of us. But he said that my soul is crushed with grief. And he wanted people to accompany him. When he prayed, he said, Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. This is only one example of Jesus set aside his feeling for everybody else's. I talked more about this one yesterday. But, you know, you can watch it. Oh, no, I'm not sure we are. No, we're not. Okay, never mind. And I want to follow Jesus because I want to follow the way of Jesus because I want to follow Jesus. Is it a loss to give up my way of pride and I follow Jesus' way of humility. At first, it seemed like a loss. But I found that it is great gain. I find that because I choose to be humble, and you can see in my stories how God helped me to be humble, that today, I have more friends. And just yesterday, I went out... Um, no, no, different story. I find that I have... I have more friends. I find that I'm satisfied. I find that I have the favour of men. But more importantly, I want to have the favour of God as I try my best to be more and more humble. And we're out of time, but I will leave you with this uh, parting verse. If you try to hang on to your life and your ways, you will lose your life. But if you give up your life and your ways for my sake, you will save it. Uh, that's it. Shall we pray?
God, we thank you because you are so humble towards us. You are so great, Jesus, but you came to die for us. You are so great, but you choose to live with us, to speak to us, and to minister to us. Jesus, help us to see how humble you are. Help us to learn from your example. Help us to see the ways in which we are proud and help us to leave our, proud, our pride to one side and be humble like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.